Thank you very much for coming in. Pleasure. I mean, these days, more often than not, when I see you interviewed, you're being asked about trans rights, about equality. Do you find the fact that nobody's talking about liberation anymore or women's roles a bit depressing? Uh, no. I try not to do depression. I mean, like most people who are depressive, I have depression from time to time. It's the black dog. It just turns up and you just have to get through it. It isn't a rational response to anything, depression. Um, it concerns me. It worries me. Uh, equality, as far as I'm concerned, is profoundly conservative aim. It would get us nowhere. It would mean that women did the things that men do, and they can make all the noise in the world about wanting to be paid exactly the same amount of money. Uh, for doing what? For doing the job in exactly the same way? This will get us nowhere. The corporate world is misery. I don't really think that men are happy in the corporate world, but they train for, for it from the time they're tiny when they had their first secret club and they had their first leader and they had their first step and fetch it and their first joker. Uh, boys live in groups and these groups are patterns for the corporate world they will eventually enter. Except that now they're so huge. And when you look at the takeovers of virtual companies by other virtual companies, you begin to wonder if we're all going mad. But men are trying to exist in this world which is cutthroat and competitive and bellicose, um, and women are fighting for entry, even though even when women invent uh, video games, they're a different kind of video game, but they're not the ones that are the biggies. Uh, we seem to be making fantasy war the whole time. Why do women want to get involved in that? Because there used to be a women's league for peace and freedom, and women understood that war is now being waged against civilians, against women and children. And yet we're saying, can we please join the army? That's the wrong aim. That's the equality aim. I want to carry a weapon. I want to be able to shoot people I've never met. I don't think we can go that way. Did you always know that? I mean, when you were writing The Female Eunuch, did you, did you, had you already decided that equality was the wrong goal? Yes. Definitely. How, how did you come to that conclusion so quickly and so early on? I could see that uh, the lives that men were leading were driving them crazy. Uh, that the corporate world is one of dog eat dog or, you know, somebody climbing up your back. If you actually look at the pattern of the corporate world, there are people falling out of it. It's actually a, a machinery for failure. And there's only one CEO at the top. And it always struck me as amazing. What does the CEO do? And the answer is nothing. His desk is empty because everything has been delegated. But when you delegate jobs to other people, if they fail, you dump them. You don't take any personal responsibility. Uh, and most of the um, hoops that men leap through in the corporate world are meant to uh, winnow them out, get rid of them. Uh, and I just thought this is hateful and we know that men are unhappy. How many times do we have to be told that men are killing themselves? Uh, we know this. We're their mothers after all. We know something about how sad they are. And we know how how uh, war is driving our soldiers mad. You know, they come back from the war and they're homeless, they're mentally disturbed, they're in prison, uh, and that we lose more soldiers through uh, self-harm and, and suicide than we do through enemy action. Doesn't anybody get it that this is wrong? I mean, I've, this is crazy. It doesn't make sense at all. I, I want to spend most of our time talking about the things you've written about in your books, but I just want to know what you think of the current state of feminist discourse and, and, the, and the things that it's seemingly obsessed by. What, what does it tell us about how much progress we've made in the last 50 years since you wrote The Female Unit? Well, I don't look at the usual indicators. Um, there may be more women earning the same pay as men, um, if that was the issue. Uh, but we still have women doing all the unpaid work the UN analyses tell us that. Um, and how can you expect equal pay for working in a paid work when you're going home to work harder for nothing? I mean, that's a simple case of 
of expecting the employer to do something that nobody else is going to do. Well, that isn't going to work out that way. Um, we keep pretending that men are doing an equal share, but every time we get the analysis of who does what, it doesn't work out that way. So do you think equal pay is a foolish goal? I think thinking of it in terms of pay, if you think of it in terms of reward, that's a bit different. You know, why do we do the jobs we do? Um, why do nurses nurse? Why do they get frustrated when they've got too much paperwork and when they haven't got enough resources and when they haven't got access to the newest techniques of, of relieving people's suffering? Uh, because they love the work. And, they, and everybody who deals with nurses or teachers or carers knows this and they make them pay. You're doing a job you love doing, you're working for people you love, you um, go home knowing that you've relieved somebody's suffering, uh, well, we'll fine you for that. We'll just pay you less because we know you won't strike. So are you, are you saying that the women who are still fighting for equal pay should be more militant? <laughs> uh, no. Well, wait a minute. Does militancy actually work? I mean, shouting and screaming doesn't work. Marching doesn't work. A negotiation could work. But, I mean, one of our biggest problems was what happened when we had the Equal Pay Act. And, it, and the male workforce was asked uh, what would be a fair outcome. And they said something they had to know was rubbish. They said women should be paid equal pay for work of equal value. And you have to say to them, what makes you think work has a value? Because you didn't get uh, higher pay for your job until you used your muscle until you went out on strike, until you did collective bargaining, until you actually wrestled with the uh, potentates, until you got a deal. And now you don't want to share the deal. And they didn't. They didn't want to share it with other workers in their own industry. So that a man tightening screws on the assembly line would be earning more because of the battles fought by his union than the women who are making upholstery. Now, you can sell a car without 50 uh, screws in it, because no one will know where they went, but don't try to sell it without upholstery, because you won't. And that's what happened in Dagenham. But you see, we keep telling those stories wrong. We pretended that Dagenham brought the women equal pay. It absolutely did not do that. And that was a distortion of the history. The women got the semi-skilled rate, which they shouldn't have got. They should have got the skilled rate. They accepted a deal, and they got done. And this is what happens to women all over. They accept a deal and they get done. The gender pay discussion, though, has followed the Me Too movement, which has also dominated uh, discussion over the last year. Um, you, you got into some sort of arguments over that because of, uh, of saying it was sort of, it, it, was, it was a whinging No, I didn't culture. use that word. My problem with it is that it's dishonourable. You know, these women claim to have been outraged 20 years ago. Far too many of them entered into an agreement uh, which involved non-disclosure, and they took payments, sometimes for a lot of money, six-figure payments. Now the statute of limitations has uh, elapsed. Now they've suddenly decided, well, we, we don't, there's nothing to gain now by keeping silent. Uh, now we're going to start are kicking ass and taking names, talking loud and drawing a crowd. Um, and we are going to now pursue the men who we consider to be malefactors here. Uh, you don't do that, in my view. That's blackmail. I don't know how it's different from blackmail. If I come to you and say, I know that you felt up a girl in the typing pool who was so frightened that she never came back to work. And I'm going to tell the papers. And you say, mm -mm 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 -mm, don't be too hasty. Uh, what will it take to keep your mouth shut? I don't know how those negotiations went on, but I think they're profoundly dishonourable. And women should never have entered into them. And it's now quite wrong to say that they've been brave. They're being brave now that the statute of limitations has elapsed in most cases. Uh, in the case of Bill Cosby, for example, Cosby was sued in a civil action by Scanton, a woman who, uh, who uh, was awarded damages. She had also signed a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, but now, uh, Scanton 
it, her case, which she won on a lower burden of proof because it's done on probability and not on the absence of all possible doubt. Now that case has been reheard under this pressure and Cosby uh, in a second retrial, because the first one fell over, a second retrial has been found guilty. And you just think this is such a mess. And the next thing that's going to happen... Isn't it writing a wrong, ultimately? I mean... No. They haven't righted anything. Even if it was a, a, a long time ago. They haven't righted it, though. How could they write it? Um, well, not writing it, but actually doing something about it, doing something to hold people to account. Because the, they, the, But the... it won't work. Krishnan, it's not going to work. The terrible thing is that Rose McGowan, I hear, I read online, has sold her house in L.A. to pay the costs for the civil case against Harvey Weinstein. She could have gone to the police about Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein for nothing, because that's what we pay our taxes so for. So what are women supposed to do, then, if, now, they, are, if they are stage, victims of some sort of sexual assault or, or, or harassment? We're not even allowed to call ourselves victims. We, we're survivors. OK, survivors. It's like the wreck of the Titanic. <laughs> and it's, it's not. It's just a fuck. And please. Um, there's a mad idea that this could destroy your life. You know, that it's the worst thing that could possibly what, happen What, a sexual to. assault? And it's not true. Well, do you think it can? Look, if it's to do with how susceptible you are, then this is more stuff we have to think about. If a woman says that you overcame me, you ignored me, you ignored me saying to you, please stop, please don't do this, and then she says, you know, you've taken my my liberty, my optimism, my light, my and they've done all this. And you think, hang on a minute. It was a fuck. How could it do all that? Why are you, have you collapsed? Because this happened. It happened to me. Couldn't you say the same of rape? Oh, but this was, in my case, it was a rape. They talk about, about consent. Here I've got a man saying, say fuck me. And I'm saying, no! He's saying, say fuck me, no! And each time he hits me across the face with the back of his hand. And I don't know if he did it five, 10, 15 times. And did I in the end say it? I can't remember. How could I remember? And at some point I tried to crawl out of the car. I was in a car where he'd taken the handles off the door. Um, and I tried to get out and he shoved the door on my head and crushed the cartilage in my ear. Um, and eventually it was completed, as they say in law. I have no idea whether it was completed or not. Uh, but it didn't kill me. Um, I, I worried about, <laughs> this is going to amaze you, but I worried about him. I thought, you poor bastard. You're completely crazy. And they're going to get you like a mad dog. They're going to get you. And you don't think that experience could destroy a woman? No. Maybe it didn't destroy you, but it you don't see that it could destroy anybody. anyone. It shouldn't destroy anyone. If it does, it's because you've been told lies about who and what you are. Um, I'm trying to think of ways around it. Most rapes don't end up in a court of law. Most rapes occur in marriage, as a matter of fact. Um, and I've just finished reading a new book, which is by Basia Briggs, where she talks about her first marriage. There was not, never in the history of womanhood was there more destructive abuse of a woman than in that perfectly suburban relationship in which her husband used and abused her relentlessly. And it never occurred to her she had a case against him because you can't bring a case against him without destroying the family. It's the same old problem we have with domestic violence. But what are you saying about those women who do say it's destroyed me then and who want to bring action? Are you it's, saying they're making it up? It's or? got... Well, we have to make it untrue. Now, the fact that they're now taking action suggests that it's untrue. But I would want to suggest that it's always untrue. Uh, the, rape isn't the worst thing that can happen to you, obviously. You know, we like to think, oh, the penis is a weapon. Susan Brown Miller said, you know, oh, it's a weapon. That's No, it isn't. You want to hurt a man, try hurting him there. It's one of the easiest places to hurt him. Speaking for myself, I kind of had a vague idea that I should grab his balls or twist them or something, but I thought I'll screw it up, I won't get it right, and he'll kill me. Uh, I didn't think, really think he'd kill me, I just, just thought he'd hit me even harder. <laughs> By that stage, I've been hit so much. Um, it isn't the worst thing that can happen to you. 
uh, it, we, we shouldn't have our young women more afraid of a penis than our sons are afraid of a knife. That is just stupid. We are not getting it. Our girls have a way out. In a way, rape is a way of escaping murder. Boys can't make that deal unless somebody wants to bugger them, which, as we know, is easier to prove in law than rape of a woman. I mean, it's all a mess because it's come down to us through masculine law. Because when women used to be the product of a man, and so the crime was against the man, the crime of rape is now against the state, and it has to be dealt with as any other crime when you have to prove the case beyond all possible doubt. In the case of consent, you can't do that. I don't turn blue when I consent. There is no way you can tell. I mean, well, what you've just said in the last few minutes is, is a really good illustration of what happens with you in these sorts of debates, though, isn't it? And that what you're doing here is making a really powerful argument about the uselessness of the law uh, mm-hmm. and how but you know, we'll rape is it. never prosecuted. But in the process but it of is it, prosecuted, women but listening to this, lost. but a lot of women listening to this will say, what you just said is utterly offensive about women and, and, and people who've been raped, and you're belittling their suffering and their experience no, by saying it doesn't, doesn't kill them. That ends up being the headline. Doesn't that happen to you a lot? That you, know, you, you say something and it kind of gets, you know, the, the headline ends up as something that you perhaps didn't intend. Well, this is why I've told you that I know about being raped. When I've written about rape in the past and said, let's try and get sensible here, let's try and understand, understand how much of it there is. If we agree that most of it is never reported to the police, is not even understood by anybody involved to be a crime, uh, then we've got to understand that the things that stick up, the horrible, brutal things, which we know were done in the case of the Pel- Belfast Four, that these things are, as it were, the peaks that stand up ab- above a huge landscape of sexual abuse, of non-consensual sex that women bear, and it does them no good at all. It erodes their self-confidence, it erodes their sense of selfhood and dignity, uh, and it impoverishes the tenderness, the mutual love that should exist between spouses. We've got to not do this. We've got to somehow deal with the fact that there's too much bad sex. You could even argue that most of the sex that happens in the age of pornography is bad sex. It's sex with organs and not with people. It's fetishistic, it is masturbatory, people are never more alone. Uh, We've not even elevated sex, we've turned it into something completely banal. But what you've said about rape, I mean, a, a man might take from that, Jermaine Greer is saying rape isn't that bad. Well, it's not as bad as murder, I'm convinced of that. But not, not just that, but that, it, but that it isn't as bad as society currently holds it. But so, so, does society hold it? Just be aware of the fact that, you know, most rapes are not reported. And all the figures about the relationship of the reported ones to the unreported ones are as soft as butter because they have no idea what they're talking about. A rape that's unreported is simply unreported. I didn't report mine. You might be surprised to learn that Mary Beard was raped on a train in Italy. She didn't report hers either. She was in Italy, didn't speak Italian, on her way to work on her PhD thesis. Her whole life would have been torn apart if she decided to try and bring a criminal case in Rome. And I can tell you it would have taken just about the rest of her life. You just can't do it. It's not doable. It's never been doable. I didn't do it because I knew that I would be discredited. What was I do? I went to a party in the suburbs. I danced with this man and we went to get a cigarette. We went out the wrong door from the party and ended up in the garden on the other side of the house. He then said, let's go for a walk. And I thought, it's too early to start screaming. So I kind of went for a walk. And then I ended up being pushed into the car and then everything else followed from that. I would have been dead to rights. I, they would have torn me to pieces. In those days, I wouldn't have even been examined for DNA. Nowadays, you get worked up over weeks Not only that, you have to surrender your mobile phone. You lose all your privacy as a rape victim because you've become a piece of evidence. So you you think that the answer to this is actually to stop trying to prosecute people for rape? No, no, it's not quite that. It's a better idea to bring a civil case for damages. But be aware you can lose it. 
You can lose it for contri contributory negligence, that you didn't behave sensibly, you put yourself in a position of jeopardy. A third party can lose it, like the people who owned the house that I was at that party, because they didn't uh, put in safeguards for young women who might be drawn off into the dim suburbs of Melbourne. And you can have costs awarded against you, uh, and it can go on and on and on, and the longer it goes on, and this is the thing, I think, about Mary and about me, that I didn't want my story to be, I was raped. That's not my story. Um, it, I was in the wrong place. It was like being hit by a bus. I didn't internalise it. It wasn't my fault. In fact, ironically, the boy involved, uh, who offended again, and I feel bad about that, because if I'd actually denounced him, and I prefer to call it denouncing, by the way, rather than complaining. If I denounced him, he might have been stopped. Because a rapist of that kind, who's extremely violent, is usually a recidivist. This is a predator, and he set me up, and he moved, and he actually had that, the car and everything, set up to do exactly what he did. So why is damages a good outcome, but a non-disclosure agreement for which you get paid $130,000 or whatever it might be for a sexual assault, not yeah, but they're a good not necessary outcome. for your sexual assault. You get paid not for being assaulted, but for keeping your mouth shut. Now, I didn't keep my mouth shut. All the people in my circle knew what had happened. And what actually happened in my case, and it sounds almost Indian, is that the guys who took me to the party, I was working as a housekeeper for four guys who owned a flat in a very luxurious part of Melbourne. And they'd taken me to the party. I then disappeared, because once I got to my feet, after being, I was badly bruised and knocked about and very dizzy, um, I just want, I thought, I wanted to go back and tell the guys, please take me home. Something awful has happened. But I thought people would be able to tell. I thought, I didn't even know if I was covered with blood. I had no idea. Um, and I just wandered up the road. The, the guys came home to the flat about an hour later, and they were very angry because it was they considered that he had taken a liberty with a friend of theirs. And what they actually did was something totally illegal, but wonderful. About three nights afterwards, I was ironing tablecloths in the kitchen. And suddenly he was there in the doorway of the kitchen. And I looked at him. And then one of the other guys standing behind him said, is this the one? And I said, yes. I said, what's going to happen now? What are they They're going to make me marry him or something? What? You know, the marriage of reparation. <laughs> Please, what's going on? He does, they took him away. They took him to the front room and they shut the door. And they said to him, because they all come from the same public school set, you know, they said, do you like uh, to ski at Hotham, do you? I said, well, don't come anymore. We get you above the snow line. And then they said, um, don't, you, don't you surf at Torquay? We get you outside, the surf line, you'll drown. And he disappeared. And that was extraordinary to actually, because it doesn't happen. I mean, and there was no legal process or anything, completely illegal, but it worked. The only thing is he, he committed the same crime again uh, with a young woman who was engaged. Um, it's a silly story. They were going to, he, she and her fiance going to a party. They needed some grog liquor. So they went to the sly grog shop and they said to this guy, whose name I completely suppressed, I have no idea what his name is, uh, they said to him, take her to the party and I'll be along with the grog. And he raped her on the way to the party. Mad as a hatter and dangerous. Throughout, throughout your, your, your public profile and a lot of your sort of uh, big television interviews and tackling big topics, you end up upsetting some people. Um, well, what am I going to do if do I don't you, do that? Yeah, well, do you, do you care about causing offence? Or, 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 or I get is, offended every day. Who's going to fix that up? I mean, it, every time Mother Brown's book, Mrs. Brown's Boys comes on television, I'm vomiting with rage. But who's going to give me a break? But do you think it's a good thing to try not to offend people? No. Or, no? No. Because you just always say whatever you think and hang the consequences. I tell the truth. One of the things that happens in rape is you're not allowed to get over it because they keep saying, if you say, I'm okay, I'm not crushed, 
I'm, I'm okay. They'll say, you're in denial. You've been traumatized and you're now denying it. You're not going, and, and this will change you for the rest of your life. Everything that happens to you changes you for the rest of your life. Uh, how can it be more dreadful than being conscripted into an army, say, and made to kill people you've never met? I mean, how can we turn this into this vast drama when there are so many worse things that are going on in the world? I mean, you, you say it's really important to tell the truth. The people who are most offended with you at the moment seem to be the trans community. Um, and this is something you get asked about a lot, even though, as far as even I can tell, not you, you, don't, you don't really write about it or, or talk about it vol voluntarily. And so it makes me wonder why you enter into this debate. Is it, is it just because somebody asks you a question, so you answer it? Uh, which debate? About whether trans women are women, you know, what is a woman, all, all of that definitional argument that you, you've been drawn into recently that has got you into a lot of trouble with a lot of people. And they're all offended with you. Well, no, they pretend to be. No, they are offended. I mean, you can no, see look, them. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I keep being told that I'm going to be not platformed, right? The people, the general public out there, thinks I've been prevented from speaking on this subject. A, I don't speak on this subject. Uh, they speak on nothing else, so leave it to them. We're not even allowed to refer to the fact that somebody is transgender. We've got to call these people women, and we've got to behave as if we cannot see that they are not as we are, when it's blindingly obvious. Um, that's all an infringement of our right of free speech, but we don't make a big fuss about that. Uh, what actually happens is they keep saying that I'm not allowed to speak on any subject whatsoever. Because I Because of that? Because, because be you've... Because they're men and they think... Well, they were men and they think that they're important. It's what about me? It's a great male question. We could embroider it on all your T-shirts. What about me? Uh, we have problems of definition about what is a woman, maybe, um, but we have many more problems connected to the fact that we are women <laughs> because people can't make sense of our anatomy or our health or what menstruation is or why some women are crippled by menstruation and can't go to work. We can't, we can't make sense how much of why do you care our about babies this issue? die in utero. Is what I don't is what I'm not sure. I mean, because there are, there are lots of feminists who find the whole question of trans women very annoying and they feel it's an assault on them and they feel it's a misogynist um, kind of I'm afraid I'm, construct. I'm, Do you, are you amongst them? Who, no, who, I'm or? more insulting, I'm afraid. I think it's uninteresting. I think we have much bigger problems and our problems are connected with things like that uh, we cannot tell a young woman, a woman, why her baby died in utero at seven months. Why can't we tell that? because we've never worked on it. Why have we never worked on it? Because of misogyny, because of lack of interest, because being interested in women's affairs is to become the most contempt of doctors, a gynecologist. Uh, so they can't answer the simplest questions. What is postpartum psychosis? How do we take care of women who are threatening to kill their babies and, and the young woman who died as they ferried her between three hospitals, a young, well-connected woman? who died because they, they eventually, they tried to restrain her. She ruptured her liver. At that stage, they decided that she needed to go to a mental hospital and she ended up dead. That is absolutely outrageous. And it should never happen in our community or indeed in any community. Don't you feel that you'd be able to spend more time on all of those questions if you just moved on from this trans question and said, not... okay, fine. If you want to join us as women, then you're women. Come and join us in the bigger struggles. Well, they're not going to help us much with postpartum psychosis, are they? Or even with menstrual discomfort. Or, um, I think we can manage, you know? We are 51% of the population and we're being held to ransom by a handful of people who are extremely vocal and aggressive. Uh, and that's no surprise to any of us. I mean, I, I don't understand why we have to make a mockery of older women. And that's universal. You say to me, I'm offending people. Every time you get vilified because you're an old woman, and you only have to be 50, not very old. I'm now 80, I'm as old as you like. Uh, and you can call me senile and anything else you want to call me. 
but I'm not going to be hijacked for this um, question of sexual identity, of gender identity. Look, I wrote a book a long time ago about how you get made into a woman. In those days, we called it conditioning. And you could see it, it happens from birth. Little baby girls are left to cry for longer than baby boys. Uh, they are fed for shorter periods than baby boys. We want them to be smaller than baby boys, and so on and so on and so on. And it goes right through our entire lifespan where we're learning femininity. And it's a masquerade. It's not who we really are. There is nothing feminine about being pregnant. It's almost the antithesis of that. There's nothing p uh, feminine about giving birth. It's a bloody struggle, and you've got to be strong and brave. There's nothing feminine about breastfeeding. God knows it drives everybody mad. They want to see nice, big, pumped-up tits, but they don't want to see them doing their job. And it just goes on and on. That masquerade is what is now being presented to us back as the real deal with the hair extensions and the false eyelashes. And you think, why do you think that's real when we all know that it isn't? So can now, you... gender, let me explain here. Sex is a given, and you can be intersex. One of the women in Genderquake is genuinely intersex. She has breasts and a penis, and she's fantastic. And she doesn't want to cut her body about. God knows it's, it's, a, it's a problem body. She has a problem when she meets someone whether she thinks they might be able to develop a relationship. When does she say, by the way, I've got a penis. She's accepted female gender. That is all fine. That's not a problem for me. Um, and intersex is relatively common, especially in certain ethnic groups, and they have ways of dealing with it. It's a completely different thing when you decide to eliminate masculinity at one end and adopt hyper-femininity at the other, because you've left all this space in here where the rest of us live. I'm not a particularly feminine person, but some aspects of my character, men would tell you, are extremely feminine. Um, I don't even think about it. So just so we can make sense of this conversation, just briefly, can you just explain to me what you mean by femininity and masculinity and how it differs from sex? <laughs> uh, well, uh, let's see. Femininity is that is learning to speak more softly. It's learning, it's why little girls want to wear a pink tutu to the shops. It's why they want their bedroom painted pink, because what they, uh, or be a princess. Um, I have, my God, children, spent five years wanting to be princesses. I had to preach many a sermon about how unhappy princesses are. Um, they're all learning that stuff, and they impose it on each other. And does femininity go with being a woman? No, but that's it's, a gender... That's the question, well, hang it? on. That's a gender thing. Now, gender can be anything you like. It can, it's entirely cultural. But unfortunately, sex is not entirely cultural. So it's something you're born with, whether you like it or not. And most of us who grow up to be women, who have our first period, 12, 13, 14, whatever, traumatizing otherwise, a body we thought we knew becomes smelly and dirty and different. And then the boys come along who've been watching pornography and say that we're not groomed, we have to remove our body hair and so on. We're going to spend our lives removing body hair. That's femininity, which is the fake version of femaleness. Female is real and it's sex, and femininity is unreal and it's gender. And it's a role you play. And for that to become the given identity of women is a profoundly disabling notion. But in the what, 48 years since you wrote The Female Eunuch, is when you first is, huh? took these notions apart of, mm -hmm. of the difference between uh, femininity and being female, do you feel that women have, you know, sort of rather disappointingly conformed to femininity, or have they followed your lead? I would be very disappointed if they followed my lead. That would make me tear my hair. You know, I'm, I'm not a, a cultist. I'm not a, um, a charismatic preacher. But there hasn't been any real divorce of femininity and being female, has oh, there, in there that has. period? That's, that's has, what I'm asking. But there has been for some people. There, I mean, there was in China. 
You know, in China, during the Great Leap Forward, men and women were indistinguishable. They looked exactly the same. Now, that's made very easy because they're the same height. Now, in our uh, race, our mixture of races, uh, speaking of basically Aryan, men are bigger than women, characteristically. Women are, are shorter. Uh, so it's hard for us to pretend to be men. And it's been one of the things that breaks my heart when I see female to male transsexuals, that they're, they have tiny hands and tiny feet. And I think just as male to female transsexuals have enormous hands and enormous feet. And I think um, here you are, you've taken male hormones, and you've grown a little beard, and your hair is cut, and you're wearing men's clothes. And here are these tiny hands and feet that are giving the game away. We don't have the drugs to give you that make you sprout big hands. Um, it's in some ways a delusion. It's a delusion that you can do it. I mean, if you think about it, why would you think I'm in the wrong body? If I cut bits off it, it'll turn into the right one. There's no logic there. It can't work. If I have a, if I have a hen, on the chopping board and I take off its leg, it doesn't turn into a cock. I mean, I can't, you can't do it. I'm really interested in the young people who didn't feature in Genderquake the other day, are the young people who've decided they don't want to be any sex, who have their secondary sexual characteristics suppressed. They remove breasts, they remove penises and, and testicles, and they want to be like angels, sexless. And I've, I've actually written about it long ago, Round about the time of the female nuke, I, I wrote a story about what would it be like if when you met people, you didn't know what sex they were, and, and you would get to know them and fall in love with them, and you still wouldn't know what was likely to happen when you became intimate. You would have to discover it. And I thought that would be amazing. So what, what, what do you think is going on there? I mean, why, why do you think we're seeing more of this publicly? Well, I think there are lots of reasons. Uh, one is that we have to have fewer children. So we might begin to uh, not practice reproductive sex as much. We would actually do more polymorphous. So you think this is sort of an evolutionary step? Well, you better hope that it is, because we really have to have fewer children. The Earth can't support us anymore. And we've already got same-sex marriage. Interesting. I don't know. I think same-sex, yes, marriage, not. Marriage has bad history, and I'm not, a, I'm not a champion of marriage, of people owning each other. I'm profoundly against that. Um, but uh, if, we're, if what's happening is we're learning different ways of pleasuring each other that don't involve the exposure of an, uh, an ovum to sperm, and it's arguable that's already happening. But you would hope it became not an imitation of slam, bam, thank you, ma'am, that it actually became more intelligent. Let's move on a few decades, actually, to, um, to the change. <laughs> to the tune, all right. Which is, which is the book that you've, you've rewritten, uh, revised, and, and, and put out again. And it's about... Well, women ageing in the menopause, as it says on the front. Mm. Why is this the book that you've re revised? Because um, a, a great deal has happened since it was first published. Uh, there are the two great cohort studies, the one in America and the one in England. And they were very badly designed. They got terribly mixed up over their terms of reference. They terrified a whole generation of women. And they got the wrong results because they'd set it up the wrong way. There are plenty of people, like Wolf Utian, for example, who is bitter about this, who says that because of what happened in that case, women have died of diseases that we knew how to prevent. And he's bitter about that. I'm, he makes, he makes a case, I'm not convinced by it. I think, I wish it hadn't been badly designed, but what we really needed was a much stronger commitment to better studies looking for specific things that we we're trying to understand. They tried to do it on the cheap, and this is the story of women, that you think you can do it that way, and they absolutely couldn't. Uh, so women, lots of women who might have got benefit from replacement steroids, dumped them and were too terrified to use them again. Um, and that was a sad thing 
but it was a direct consequence of the fact that the replacement steroids, HRT as we call it, had been oversold, ridiculously oversold. They were not the elixir of youth. They would deal with specific problems connected with... Now, what I can't say is oestrogen deficiency, because we never proved it. Uh, but it's to do with the fluctuations in oestrogen secretion in the body of a menopausal woman, who could be anything from 30 to 60. So that's another vagary that we can't fix. So I want to say, yes, uh, replacement steroids have a role, uh, but be skeptical and don't take them for any longer than you need to. Are you going to revisit any of your other works and revise them? No, I don't think so. The female eunuch doesn't need rewriting. No, 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 it needs another book, somebody else's better book. No, 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 it's very much a book of its time, and it's not a very good book. I'm perfectly happy to see somebody else write a better one. It's a bit disappointing that it's on reading lists for kids at school. Still, I could go because and so much has them. changed. What's wrong mean? with it? I don't believe a word of it. <laughs> what is wrong with it? Oh, it's, it's too literary, um, because that was my milieu. I didn't have much acquaintance with the real world. I was a bookish person. And now I think the academic uh, character of so much feminism, the fact that it went into university courses rather than into uh, industry and, and politics, uh, it beca it's become ridiculous. Just in the last few minutes, can, can I just ask you a few little sort of advice questions then? Advice? Yeah. I don't give advice. Advice questions, as, 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 you know, for, for people bringing up children. <laughs> How should they raise their sons and daughters to think of femininity and masculinity? Because, you know, a lot of parents, I've, I've got young children, a lot of parents will say, God, it's amazing, you know, how they sort of, they, they fall into their gender roles, how the girls just want to play with dolls, how boys and girls want to play separately, um, how the boys want to play sports and the girls don't. I mean, is all of that nonsense? Have you got to try actively to try and break that as a parent? I think you're on a prayer to nothing. I just, it's not going to happen. Um, I've been watching little girls because I'm fascinated by this pink business. And I think pink stinks. It's an awful chemical colour. I wish it was some other nice colour. Um, and I realise that in many cases, it's a kind of guerrilla activity. They're forming a little bunch of stormtroopers in favour of pink. And they want their hair very long, dangling in their faces. I mean, the children who've grown up in my house all got their hair cut because it used to drive me mad that they had hair in their mouths and they're trying to eat and all that sort of thing. So out would come the scissors and they would have a little basin crop and they all wore bib overalls. Um, and the funny thing is somebody gave one of my godchildren a doll and she threw it down the stairs. And I found myself saying, oh, poor Dolly, why did you... I thought, shut up. She's not playing mothers today. Good on her. Boys, on the other hand, have a really challenging life career ahead of them. They have got to join male groups and they've got to learn their place in the pecking order. And they're going to be bullied and manipulated and uh, negotiations will go on. And we're, ultimately, we are hominids rather than, than homo sapiens. So they're very, like, they're very much like ape communities where you've got the silverback who's the ruler then you've got all the junior apes who are trying to, jockeying for position. Then you've got the ape that's um, placating people by being funny. Then you've got uh, all the women, by the way, are foraging for this group of useless men who are playing uh, games of who's, who's top ape, who's top dog. And you don't think you can break that cycle? You can, and the result will be you'll get children who choose intermediate roles. So your sons may decide that they're going to be uh, gay, effeminate, whatever. Uh, and that to me, that's very interesting to me because I think it is um, a knowing rejection of masculinity as miserable, as cruel, and ultimately very damaging. I mean, we don't do assessments on men who kill themselves as to their you know, masculinity factor. But I've always regarded suicide as a crime of anger rather than sadness. 
We, get, we live with sadness. It's the thing around us all the time. But when you lay violent hands on yourself, it's because you're angry. And I think that's masculinity is involved there. I think masculinity is really hard. And once upon a time, we needed it, maybe, when we were fighting hand to hand. But we need now to somehow get over it because it's turning lethal in modern society. Well, you, you, you probably teed up another conversation that I'll have to invite you back for. But Jermaine Greer, thank you very <laughs> much indeed for that. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you.